So I'm based out of Macon Ridge Research Station in Winsboro. Uh, at this point, I'm working eight crops, and uh, rice is one of them. I've been growing rice at Macon Ridge Research Station for seven seasons. Last year was the first time I tried row rice, and um, I did okay. <laughs> it was uh, it was definitely a challenge, and uh, there's some things I'm going to tweak this year to try to do a little better job for y'all. But we've seen an acreage increase in row rice over the years. It's gone. It was up to about 35,000 in the northeast region last year. There's a little bit down in St. Landry Parish, but the vast majority of it's up here. Um, and I've seen. I was talking with uh, Dr. Goldson there. He's, he, we see a lot of different configurations, row spacings, you know, slopes and fields. Um, just a lot of farmers do things differently. Uh, they don't all do it the same, uh, which makes it a little, a little challenging. Um, you know, I've seen where situations where some hold their tail water and some don't. But the benefits, you know, you have more rotations options up here and also, you know, less water use is the name of the game. And uh, I, I learned real quick that the nitrogen fertilization is a little tricky uh, compared to, to flood rice. Uh, diseases of concern up here in this neck of the woods, um, blast, of course, and row rice blast is going to be our major concern because that's an upland condition and that disease can get pretty bad in, uh, in, in under those situations. Sheath blight seems to be ever present. I got more calls this year in soybean, but the same pathogen that causes aerial blight in soybean than I ever have in the northeast region. So that, that pathogen is on the rise, I think. If you've got a rice and soybean rotation, you, it's going to be a problem in your rice fields. So um, also up here, kernel smut, fall smut can show up um, and occasionally sarcosmin. We'll look at blast. It's caused by a fungus. Again, most severe under upland conditions. Uh, it, can, it can affect all the plant parts, leaves, nodes, panicles, everything. Um, it survives in the seed, crop debris, surviving rice plants. Surviving rice plants aren't a problem up here. I think it got cold enough to take any of those out that were left. But we're looking at temperatures between 70, 77 and 83 in the day and 63 and 73 at night. So if we get a situation in the summer where we got those cooler nights, that's going to be a little more favorable for disease development. Um, and that pathogen is genetically diverse, so it has the, it has the ability to overcome uh, varietal resistance. So that's one thing. That's why we have to continue to, to develop resistant varieties. I'll change the slides for me. I'm up again. Yeah. There we go. Sheep blight, soil borne disease. So it's going, this fungus can live in the soil for many years. And the way it does that, it creates these little things that are uh, they range inside from number four to buckshot, um, so and they can live for years. They're called sclerotia, they, they, and they'll get hard like like little pea gravel. Um, again, this is this pathogen has a wide host range, so it'll go to it'll go to cotton, uh, grain, sorghum, corn. Although I don't see disease get that severe in corn. Corn, it's a rarity to find sheep blight in. Um, cotton is, is a rarity. One field down in uh, Rapides Parish last year had sheath blight, terrible sheath blight, and it uh, really surprised me. So if you watch out for it, watch out on your grain sorghum if you have any grain sorghum this year. Uh, warm temperatures and high, hum high humidity, I don't have to tell you all this is Louisiana and that's the way it is. Uh, we're going to have those conditions every year, and but we do, the, most of our hybrids have some degree of resistance to, to sheath blight. And we see higher losses with long grain varieties than we do with medium grain varieties. All right, Cercospora may be a problem. It's kind of a rarity up here. Uh, it's also known as narrow brown leaf spot. Low nitrogen rates and high nitrogen rates can favor infection. And this can infect the sheath, glooms, panicles, and the grain. Later, your later planted rice is going to be at a higher risk, which I see that with Cercospora species and other, other uh, crops. Um, this pathogen is genetically diverse. Cercospora is notorious for, for being genetically diverse. Um, eventually, they'll probably find out that there's more than one species involved here. But this can also overcome varietal resistance. Next slide. Kernel smut. Um, this seems to be a, a, an issue up here, a significant issue in a given year. This fungus basically replaces the grain with, with black sooty spores. Um, it, it, it colonizes that grain, and I've heard of losses up to about 30% in, 
in the worst case scenario. Long grains more susceptible than short grain. Uh, high nitrogen rates favor development. Uh, infection with these smuts, uh, they, they occur at or near flowering. False smut's another one. False smut you can differentiate because it's orange, it later turns olive green. That fungus pretty much does the same thing and colonizes the kernels. Um, you see this late planted and flooded soils with uh, excessive nitrogen and uh, not known if significant yield losses occur. Uh, some, of you, some of you in the room probably know better than I do if, you, if you've gotten significant losses uh, due to this, but these smuts, they'll cause quality issues as well. So we've got our diseases here that we need to be concerned about. So let's look at what varieties we're planting and hybrids we're planting in the Northeast uh, region. Last year we had 100,000 total acres, give or take. And I, I took this information from Dust, Dustin Harrell, put this together um, for 2020. That's about 21% of the acreage in the state. So in a given year, I've seen it be 25% up here. It ranges about 20, 25%. Uh, 80,000 acres of that's long grain, 20,000 acres medium grain, and 20,000 acres of it is actually Jupiter. So, a third of our acre and a third of our acres is farmed is row rice in upland condition. So we're looking at around about 33,000 acres or 35,000 acres in, in the last year that was that was row rice. Next slide. So if we look at those varieties and we look at their uh, disease susceptibilities and resistance, um, we can pretty much say that these ratings get a little different depending on what university you looked at. But for kernel smut and fall smut, just assume that, that, that most, of, most of your varieties are going to be susceptible. Next slide. Now, as far as blast goes, we've got Jupiter, CL163, CL153. Those are the ones that are susceptible to, to blast that we grow up here. Now there are others, 8% of our acres. There's a, there are other varieties in here, but these are just the, the main ones we're growing. Next slide. Sheep blight, same varieties plus uh, the 7521 there. So you're looking at sheep blight and those varieties are the ones that are gonna be most susceptible. Next slide. Cercospora, we've got one here, CL153. So that might explain why we don't see Cercospora year in and year out because most of our acreage has some degree of resistance to that particular organism. We don't, I don't have a rating for 7521 on Cercospora. Go ahead, next slide. And there's no sense in reinventing the wheel here with fungicides. Dr. Growth has done an excellent job over the years putting this table together. If you don't have a copy of that 2021 rice varieties and management tips in your, on your, in your truck, you need one. Put it on the dashboard because I use that thing extensively every year in managing my plots. All every bit of information you need just about is in that book. And this is a uh, this chart right here tells us what we have in our toolbox as far as fungicides go. We've got our strobilins, we've got our group sevens, carboxamides, and we've got our uh, DMI fungicides, which also are known as triazoles. It'll give you the active ingredient here, give you the the products that it's sold under. It'll give you a rate range to use, and for each disease, it'll give you a rating on, on the efficacy of that product. So in the case of blast, you want to use something that has that strobilin material in it, the group 11 material, or, um, you know, or a mixed mode of action, a, a premix with the, with the strobilin in there. For sheath blight, same thing, but uh, the SDHIs are also effective on sheath blight. Uh, QI resistance, I don't know that we have that up here yet, but I'm going to tell you it's something you need to keep on your radar because you can only outsmart Mother Nature for so long. Eventually, we're going to have resistance in that pathogen population. And we're going to be in the same boat. Our rotation options up here may keep us out of that longer than they did in South Louisiana. South Louisiana, they were doing rice, soybean, rice, soybean, rice, soybean, and they quickly built up resistance to that path, to, to that to the strobilin fungicide. Hopefully, it'll stay away, but it's something you need to be aware of anyway. With Cercospora, Go back. All right. With Cercospora and, 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 and kernel smut, you want to have a product out there that contains that uh, one of those trizoles. All right. Timing. Timing is everything, depending on the, the disease. So that kernel smut application is going to go out at some point uh, after boot prior to heading. Uh, Cercospora application, uh, boots a heading timing. 
but can go earlier if you see disease earlier in the season. The blast one is tricky. And I don't know if any of you have ever grown wheat and had to put out a fungicide application for scab. This is a lot like that. It is a tight application window for blast. So you've got to hit it at 50 to 70% panicle emergence um, to, to get any kind of uh, efficacy on that application. Sheath blight, if you see it early, you might as well go ahead and spray for it. Um, and that can range anywhere from PD plus seven uh, all the way out to heading. Next slide. I'm gonna take the opportunity here and I'm, I'm probably going over time. I think we're gonna run late on this meeting, but um, to give you an idea of what we're doing at Macon Ridge Research Station, essentially I've got a flood rice area and I've got a road rice area. And I'm doing fungicide efficacy trials in both, the same trials. And we're looking at disease severities and we're looking at fungicide efficacy in road rice. Uh, also, we're cooperating with, with Dr. Formosa. We're actually going to do uh, upwards of 500 plots this year for him, different breeding trials and help him out with his variety development program, uh, which is good to have some plots up here in this region uh, for developing varieties. We'll also get the occasional industry trial there, seed treatment trials or foliar fungicide efficacy trials. Um, this, that's, that's the type of work we're doing at Macon Ridge Research Station in, in the past couple of years. We've, uh, we've upped our, our game and we're doing a lot more tests there in the field. That's just an overview of our tests there. Uh, some drone shots that, you know, they always look good for uh, presentations. One other thing we're doing, Macon Ridge Research Station has a terrible salt water problem. We've got really high salt in our well. So we're, we're working with a breeder on campus, screening uh, salt tolerant rice lines for him to see if he can uh, develop some that will tolerate salt. But this is our setup here. We just had a flood on the left, row on the right, and you can see I had a little too much row there, I think. Uh, I had to let me go to the next one, let's see. This is what it looked like later in the season where we had it in flood. Flood plots look great, great stands. Uh, my row rice plots, I didn't get my, I didn't get stands that like I wanted and I battled weeds all year long. Um, but they were good enough to keep and we still ended up getting some decent trials out. This is an example of the type of trial here, and I know this is complicated. The only take home message here that we saw in this trial is our, our fungicides were working on sheath blight, and I inoculated these plots. I put the fungus out there. But in the row rice situation, which is uh, represented by the yellow bars here, in every case nearly, we had lower disease. So we may have a little less aptitude to get sheath blight in row rice situations, or this could be a reflection of my. Uh, my less than optimal stands that I have. So, next one. It works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. This is this is just a typical trial and these products on, at the Macon Ridge Research Station, we're still seeing activity on sheath blight with our quadrus and our gym. Those are straight strobing materials. That's sold as uh, Flint now, I think. Uh, Circadus, the SDHIs are working. And of course, Quilt Excel was working fine on sheath blight at Macon Ridge. Next slide. The whole reason I did these trials was I was hoping to get some blast pressure. I don't want you to have blast in your field. I want to have blast in my field. And the nearest rice field to me from Macon Ridge is probably 15 miles. So um, I planted the right variety. We just didn't have the right weather. We developed a little bit, little bitty lesions of blast, but the weather was not right for the disease to progress. We're going to keep trying this. In, until we until we can develop some uh, disease pressure there, that's that's less than one on a zero to nine scale. So, disease was not bad at all in that trial. Next slide. The take home here is approximately two thirds of the varieties we plant in the northeast region have some degree of disease resistance. So that's a good thing. Uh, so that means a third of them are susceptible to one disease or another or multiple diseases, and a third of our acreage is in a row rice situation. Um, if you're planting row rice, I, you, you need to plant blast resistant varieties because that disease can be explosive in, in, under the right situations. The ones to watch, the susceptible ones to watch, if you've got row rice, you need to watch your Jupiter, your 163, your 153, and the 7521. So you definitely need to scout those for blast closely. If you have a problem, you need to time that application just right. Uh, correctly identify the disease. If you need help identifying that disease, that's what we're here for. All I need is a sample and I go look at it under the microscope to, to confirm that's what you have. A lot of times you can just do it by looking at pictures. 
uh, these iPhones. My number is, is readily available on the internet. Send me a picture. I'll come out to your farm and, and look at look at whatever you got and be glad to help you. That's my job and that's, probably, that's one of my favorite parts of my job. So uh, choose the right fungicide and apply it at the right time. And next slide. And that's it. I thank you all for the opportunity. I thank you for your checkoff dollars. We use that money to pay our, pay our employees, to try to generate information. It's going to help your bottom line. So with that, I entertain any questions or, or comments.